Good afternoon. It's Tuesday. We are back with another Make a Thing stream today. And today we are going to be making an infinite runner game. Uh, this one that we're going to be doing today, uh, the player actually doesn't move uh, as such. The only coordinates it changes are its Y coordinates when you jump. Uh, but the obstacles will be flying at you thanks to the bullet behaviour. Uh, so the final project looks a little bit like this. Works with mouse and keyboard and works with touch. So we press space to jump. We have different obstacles coming through. Some you need to jump over and if you hit them you get game over. But we have a high score that gets registered. Let's try and beat the high score. You can duck under certain enemies. Uh, if you've ever, you know, been stuck in Google Chrome and you've got no internet, this is very akin to the little dinosaur mini game you get. That was kind of what I was going with for this. But you know, the ground is always moving, and uh, the backdrop is also is also scrolling along too, which is which looks nice. Um, so yeah, and just to show you, if we close this and then start preview again, our high score from last time is saved because we are saving that into local storage. So you've got a persistent high score, which is nice. Now one more go and see if I can beat it. Might need to adjust my bees. So as you're running along, your score's going up. And every time you clear an obstacle, then you get an extra five points. I beat my score up by one, so we'll, we'll leave that there. Uh, let's start a new project. And we'll do what we did last time, which is have the completed uh, on one side and the new one on the other side. So we can kind of compare how things are going as we as we build. You can see what I'll walk you through what all of the events in here do uh, as we make them. So hopefully you get a little bit more of an understanding about how the project is put together. Uh, so let's just set up a few important bits. Like we'll name this and we'll call it Infinite Runner. I'm hugely imaginative. Now we need you to change the size of the viewport to 1024 by 576. Still a 16 by 9 ratio, so should still look quite nice on most things. We need to start adding some objects. We will need local storage to be able to do saving. We'll want the keyboard. We'll want the mouse. We will need some sprites. What I'll do is I will start with um, plain uh, placeholder graphics because the way the actual project is set up, uh, everything like the uh, bullet behavior and the platform behaviors, they're all set onto boring square so uh, sprites with the animation set on top as separate objects. So we'll do that if we've got time. But in the meantime, let's get our basics in. So this one's going to be our player box. We go with 80 by 80. The only things that's going to have actual uh, images in them are our background and our floor. So lock that for the minute. Again, we'll use another tiled background object. What our grass? 2048. So it's double the size of the background. There we go. So we have our player box. Make this darker blue. Now this needs to be again 80 in width. But much higher. And we're going to position it at about 
270. Same with the player. It's kind of a good distance into our layout, so it's a good starting point for our runner. That needs to stretch all the way across. But we need to be able to see what's going on behind it, so we'll put it down to 25% opacity. And this is our player collision. So when I said that when you jump over or you avoid obstacles, uh, you gain an extra five points, that's because this invisible collision object is colliding with your enemies. And that's what triggers the extra score. Now, both of our scenery objects need the bullet behavior. Turn off set angle for both of them. Speed of 400 for the time being is fine. And that's kind of all we need to get started. Let's add some global variables. We have player start X, which initially is 270. So that's where we set the player box and the player collision in the layout. So this is the starting X point of the player. And basically this is kind of going to act as a constant. In fact, we can tick it as constant. Um, it's going to act as a constant for us to permanently set the player's position so that it doesn't actually move um, and become displaced. We obviously need a way of keeping track of our score. So we have the score and to go with that, we have a high score variable so that we know uh, we A has something to store in local storage and B we can see what the highest score is on the device. We need a boolean to track whether the player has lost the game or has been killed by a wall, whatever you want to call it. So for that we're just going to call it player alive. And we also need one called spawn type. Uh, when we get on to doing our obstacles and so on, then we are going to use uh, random numbers to determine what kind of obstacle is spawned, and that's where our spawn type variable comes in. So we have our initialization stuff here. So we're going to need an on start of layout. event we're going to need an every tick event okay so we won't worry about local storage to start with but every tick we are going to need to set our player box position or we'll set its x value to player start X. We don't want the collision to be directly over the player. We kind of want it to be set back slightly just so that it's, you know, you clear the object and then you get the prize, as it were. So we need to set the X to player start X minus, we'll say 10. Okay. What we then need to do is try and get our background and our ground to scroll correctly. So it looks, you don't have to do this, you could just have a simple plain coloured background, but it's quite nice to give the idea that the player is running while the object itself isn't actually moving. And to achieve this, we basically have a very large backdrop object, and when it gets to a certain X point, then it loops back to where it was beginning and carries on rolling to the left using the bullet behavior. So we need to compare X and say if it's less than or equal to its own width over 2 then we want to set its X value to self.x plus self dot width over two. If we can put in brackets just. And we want to do the same thing with the ground. Press R to replace an object. And we just replace that with ground. Ah, 
what we do need to do <laughs> is currently they are we haven't actually because we turned off set angle uh, which means we need to manually set the angle at which these things are traveling and currently they are moving at an angle of zero degrees which is to the right not particularly helpful if we want them to move to the left our player is traveling right so everything else should be traveling left so we need to set the angle of motion to 180. Copy and paste and replace that with the ground. Uh, let's turn that off for the moment. So at least we always have ground. There we go. The background can just scroll for the minute. I mean, we could turn it off as well. There we go. <clears throat> so let's at least get some... Uh, Let's get some obstacles in here. These are going to be in varying shades of red, I guess. Maroon, whatever we want to call that. Uh, right, system objects, keyboard, on key pressed, space, because I like the space bar. Then we want to simulate the jump. Our platform behavior. So let's try and spawn some uh, obstacles. If I can't have the background scrolling, then I may as well at least have things flying at you. We start with an every X seconds. We go random. Uh, we'll make it slightly longer, so it's a little easier. So 0.75 and 3.5 seconds. Then we want to set there it is set value of our spawn type to floor random between zero and three and then we say if our spawn type is equal to zero we want to system create object We'll say this is our spikes on layer zero, way off the viewport. So we'll say it's at 1200x and y. I think about 450 should be about right. We'll obviously need to check it when we actually start this. Copy, paste, paste. So if spawn type is equal to one, then let's create our air enemy. We want to make that higher up. So let's say 350. And if spawn type is two, then we need to spawn our wall. The wall's a little different. Might as well, we'll leave it at that for now, just to make sure they actually work. Because currently there's no collisions that won't do anything. So we can just literally see if the spawning stuff is working. Cool. I'm hoping. Did I put the bullet behavior on? I bet I didn't. I did not, so they don't actually move. <laughs> Bullet. Actually, no. Because families are useful and we will need one later. Enemies. So, family behaviors, we want the bullet behavior. Our wall should also be solid. There was a ding in my ears. Pombear 1234, thank you for the follow. I do not remember the last time I had Pombears, but they are great crisps. Well, the bullet's working. But what we need to do, whereas with the background we're not setting the angle, in these ones we are, so angle needs to be 180 which currently doesn't matter because they are just squares. Hopefully, there we go. There's our air. There's our ground. With any luck, there's a wall. So that is how we spawn the different kinds of obstacles. For some strange reason, it's deciding that it wants it to be over there. This is how it should look confused as to why it suddenly decided the origin points were wrong but fine i am not going to argue so it's all well and good that we can spawn all these obstacles to jump over 
But obviously something needs to happen when our when our player collides with them. So player box on collision with, and this is why we have the family. Now this is where our player alive boolean can come in. So we want to where are you? In here. Set the val nope, set the boolean. Player alive to false on the start of the layout. We can set the boolean to be true. Now when the boolean is true, then we want to make sure everything is running as it's as it should. So actually we can move those to there. We also want to make sure that the enemy's bullet behaviour is enabled, not disabled. And we want to make sure that the player has their platform behaviour enabled. There it is. Copy and paste, excuse me, no. Copy and paste, we can invert that. I should know those should probably stay at the top. We need to disable them though. Uh, scenery. Uh, copy and paste that and replace that with the ground object. And drag those down there. But these all now need to be disabled because we don't want this. We don't want everything to still move while the player is losing. Okay. So in theory, if we hit a an obstacle, everything should stop. Yeah. And that would be the point where you'd put up your game over screen or whatever else you wanted. We are going to want some text objects so we can show our scores. So now we can add to our every tick event and we want to say set the text of the score object to the score global variable and we want to set the high score text to the high score variable which is all well and good but currently we're not actually setting anything so if we do that they will just be zeros now there it's not ideal So what we need to do is actually start setting a score. A very simple way to do this is another every x seconds, let's say every half a second, we want to add one to the score. And if our collision box for the player, that big tall block we put in, collides with an enemy, then we want to add five to the score. So there's just that little bit of extra, I don't know, bit of an extra prize when you clear an obstacle. And the other thing we want to say, when our player is not alive, we want to check whether Compare to very to the no. compare to var I can words compare two values. We want to compare I score. We want to compare score. And if that is greater than high score, then set high score to score. We need to add in here add Another condition that our is player alive boolean set. Your score should not be going up when it's game over. Perfect. Uh, my walls are still well off, but never mind. So we'll just tweak our set text to score 
and then the variable number and high score. There, that should be a little more obvious now. There we go. In the um, in my test project, there are actually two wall objects. We have the wall collision and we have the actual wall. And at the time I wasn't convinced that you actually needed it. Now I see why you do. So what we need to do, go into our, go into our enemies family. And we need to edit the family and take the wall out. Then we need to pop in here and we need to create a new object. New sprite going to be in a lighter one of these colours. And this is going to be our wall collision. And this needs to go into the family. What we will need to do is actually re-add the bullet behaviour to the wall. Okay. So that's 100 by 350, so we'll make that the same size. And I'm going to put it into a container with the wall. It shouldn't make too much of a difference because we're going to set the positions anyway, but it just helps to keep things in check. Do we need to do it as the spawn another object? Nope, that's better. So now you can see our collision object is there. It does mean we can also land on top of it and it's not you. Which is what we really want. You kind of want to be able to jump over and like land on a wall. You can use it as a springboard off to other things. Great! So that now works properly. What we are going to need to do uh, if you're playing this game for a long period of time, granted they're just squares, so they're not going to take up masses of room, but you don't really want them carrying on forever into the abyss. We need to be able to get rid of them to clear up memory and all that kind of stuff. So, when our enemies, we need to compare their x value. If x is less than minus 175, then we want to destroy it. So let's make sure that that high score is recorded for all of time. And that means using local storage. So on the start of the layout, we need to check and see if the storage key exists for the high score. So system objects, local storage, check item exists. And the key we will use is high score. Then we need to say, I keep using system, but it's in, a, it's in system objects. If the item exists, high score, then we want to set the value of high score to, uh, what was it? Local storage dot item value. However, One day I will do it without pressing system first. If the item is missing, so it's the first load, for example, or you've cleared your cache or whatever, if high score is missing, then we want to set high score with the value of the high score variable. Then we want to say, If the score is greater than the high score, set high score to score, and we want to write the new high score to local storage. So now, in theory, if we get a score, we'll set a new high score, and then we'll close and reboot this. Our high score still stands, and we can go and try and beat it. But oh no, we lost. High scores reset to 84.
and we're still at 84. So our local storage stuff is working well. That's really good. So this is all well and good and it does run and it's great and the game works. This is lovely. But to restart the game, you've got to close the preview. You've got to close the thing, reboot it. It's a bit of a pain. So what we could do is a very simple menu. And that's literally just going to house a button. When we press the button, the game restarts. So the menu needs to be, yeah, we will have it initially visible. We want it to be a zero parallax layer. Cool. And then we want a new sprite. We'll put it there, get three. Then we need so that is our, come on, let me uh, rename please, button, and we're going to want another piece of text, uh, that'll do, start, there you go, and then we want to say, so our on start of layout is going to change. want to make sure that our menu layer is visible it should be because it's initially visible but just in case we make a mistake further down the line we need to make sure that's there so we now need a thing that says is the layer visible if our menu layer is visible that up here and we want to add a trigger because otherwise everything will keep firing and that's not particularly helpful. Do we have it? No, we don't want that. I need to invert that. So, we need to make sure our score is reset. Because we're no longer restarting the layout. So we need to make sure our score gets reset back to zero. That's then when these need to move into. And we need to say, if we press our button, this is where the mouse object comes in. On object clicked, the button. Then we want to make the layer invisible those don't need to be there anymore. When player is not live, we want to set the menu layer back to visible. So actually we can take those out as disabled and change that to destroy. We need to add some more bits into our layer, into our, when our menu is invisible. You obviously don't want the game to start immediately. You want to give the player a little, like, tiny bit of time to prepare. First thing we want to do is set the HUD text to visible. Then set its text. We'll just say ready. Add a wait. Drag that back up here. Then we change it to go. Then stick in another wait, short one, half a second. And then we start everything else off and hide the text box again. Then if the player is not alive, we should set the HUD box back to visible. Set its text to game over. Add in another wait. Wait for a second and then set the menu layer visible. Uh, where are you? You need to be initially visible. 
Hopefully that means our button should work. You start when the player is not alive. Get rid of that. That's better. What's bizarre? Those need to be triggered once. Yes, they do. Our mouse button. Set score to zero. Visibility to visit it. That, that one. Yep. Not there. Really? Now you work. Okay, cool. Well, there you go. Funny how rearranging uh, some events can fix things for you. All right. Well, in that case, if we've got this working, I'm going to rename that to ready go and we'll have we will clone that and rename it game over we'll overlap that that one again it needs to be initially invisible which is great uh, i'm going to add another global boolean which is first load on the start of the layout the first load should start actually through so when you start the layout then we want to set it to false actually no let's not do that let's put that here because that's going to start all of that off that there okay and then under here player is alive as another condition system is boolean set not first load then set the game over text to visible that's going to be in a sub event pull that down And when the button's pressed, we just need to set game over text to invisible again. Let's just see and make sure that looks all right. We can play around with placement of things once uh, the mechanics are in. Nice. Oh no. All that's left to do now is start getting some uh, animations in. Let's start off with the player. And this is our walk animation. Well, it's going to be running, but you know. Set our speed to about 10. There you go. Then we want to add a jump. And we want to add slide. Oops. There we go. Add slide. Cool. Then Every tick, name that. You want to play a sprite, set position to another object, play a box. Add event to game. Well, this is going to go into play specific actually. Add event. Player box is on floor. Then we want to set animation to walk. If the player box is jumping, 
then we want to set the animation to jump. And then, finally, nope, keyboard. If we say it's key is down, because then you can hold down the down key. If the down key is being held down, then we want to set the animation to slide, I believe is what I called it. I didn't call it anything. Well done, me. I suppose because that is uh, flashing with it. Let's add another condition in there. That works. Cool. All right. There we go. So she now jumps, slides, runs along the floor. We just need to do a little bit of tweaking of that image point. If we bring that Y coordinate down a little bit. It's a 65. Applies a whole animation, applies all animations. Better. Uh, so platform is on, so what we want to do is um, a variable Nope. Uh, is Boolean set. Player alive. Put that in here. And then we can just pop in here wherever my player is not alive bit. The animation to hurt. See, we need to go and add. And we want to bring that down to 65 as well. Rename hurt. Okay, so we need some more sprites. So we'll pop you two in a container. Our new sprite, which we will name Enemy B. Okay, let's set the position like we do for the player. Replace player box with our enemy and replace player sprite with enemy B. Look. There we go. It's a bee. Lovely. Let's do the same thing for our spikes. Okay, we need to move the image point of the spikes image. That's better. It could come up a little higher, but I think that's fine. Well. Up. Can we go 75. There we go. That will do. We'll stop messing about with that now. And finally, what we can probably do because we already have the wall collision is if we come in here, I'm going to change that to 128 by 128 because that is the size of the sprite I believe we're about to drop in. That is our slime block. The spikes look better, that's a good start. They can probably come up slightly more, but they're fine. Most of the bees you can just slide under. We could drop them further down so you could uh, jump over them if you wanted to. Yeah, that needs to change. So each object now has an angle of 180. The angle is then set by the bullet behavior. And we just manipulated the animations to look right. The easiest way to do it. <laughs> Let's give our player box a little more jump strength because our walls are quite large. I think that's about everything. I just need to make sure all of our boxes are hidden so you can't see them. The spikes now sit nicely on the ground.
We can jump over. Shrink those a little bit. Shrink the top down so you can actually stand on the top of the blocks. Yay! There we go. Lovely. That's what we want. Now let's just make sure everything that's not supposed to be visible is not visible. Should just be those two now. We can... I believe there's a face missing in my score, which is annoying me. There is. That's better. It's a little bit bigger. I can't bother to change fonts because at this point it's just a demo, so who cares? Now we're running, our score's going up, you can't see the hitboxes for the bees anymore, which is nice. Bikes are good and flush. Our animations work nicely. A little weird about, you know, you can slide while landing, but I cannot be bothered to fix that right now. It wouldn't take much, we just stick another animation in and tell it if it's falling to play that. Jump on top of our blocks. Hooray! Everything works. It looks reasonable. It looks better than my standard, you know, square-based projects. So I'd say this is a success. See you all next week. Bye-bye, guys.